before going into the topic, uh, let me ask you one question. What did you have in the morning? If I ask you, what did you have in the morning or yesterday for dinner? Immediately you would say you, you had rice or chapatis or dal. Likewise, the answers will come. So, for the survival of human beings, food is essential. That is one of the basic necessities. And where do these food come from? Primarily, indirectly or indirectly? Primarily, the source is plants, which are known as the primary producers. Now, these primary producers, they undertake the first wonder phenomenon of nature, that is photosynthesis. And that is the basic process through which the food is prepared. Now, these plants also require several nutrients, similarly uh, other minerals for their survival. And today, we are going to discuss upon the nutritional requirement of crops as well as the nutritional disorders in crops. And the topic for, for discussion is nutritional disorders in crops. And through this uh, topic, we will be discussing upon the essential nutrients, their classification, forms absorbed by plants, that is the forms in which these nutrients are being absorbed by the plants, nutrient availability and mobility, critical concentration concept, basic functions of these nutrients, nutrient interactions and finally deficiency and toxicity. Now at the outset, let us see what are these essential nutrients. Now these are nutrients which are required for the proper growth, development and productivity of crops. And there you can see a basket of nutrients. And as on date, 17 nutrients have been categorized as essential for plants. Among all the hundreds of nutrients that we have, 17 have been designated as essential nutrients. Now, whether these all these 17 nutrients are received from one media? No, it is not like that. Of these three nutrients, that is carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, that is received from the atmosphere. Whereas the remaining 14 are the basic source is the soil. Now if you see the classification of these essential nutrients, you can see three major categories there. One is the basic nutrients, the second is the macronutrients and the third is the micronutrients. So basic nutrients as I uh, mentioned earlier, these are the three nutrients that a crop receives from the atmosphere that is carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Whereas macronutrients as the name indicates macro means bigger in size. So these are nutrients that are required in comparatively larger quantities. So that includes nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium and sulfur. Of these six the first three that is nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, these are the three giants. They are referred to as the primary nutrients while calcium, magnesium and sulfur, they are known as the secondary nutrients. Now the third category is the micronutrients. So these micronutrients, they include iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, chlorine and nickel. So that includes there are eight micronutrients that have been designated now. Now when you say about micronutrients, it is something like adding salt while we are cooking. Addition of salt means without salt, the food will not be delicious. So salt is essential. But think of a situation where you by a mistake you are adding a larger quantity of salt. You will not be able to have that food. In a similar manner, Micronutrients are required but in small quantities but they are essential. Now if you see a bit more uh, detailed classification, here you can see 
based on the relative essentiality that is one type of classification where you have the essential nutrients then you have the beneficial nutrients. So essential nutrients we have already seen the basic nutrients which are also known as the non-mineral nutrients and the mineral nutrients that we have seen. Now the second category is the beneficial nutrients. So beneficial nutrients they don't come under the purview of essential nutrients but at the same time the presence of these nutrients prove to be beneficial for the plants and they include cobalt, sodium, vanadium, silicon all these are considered as beneficial elements. Then another type of classification is based on the function and behavior and there you can see four groups group 1, 2, 3, 4 and here you can see basic structural nutrients are there then accessory nu structural nutrients are there, there are nutrients with regulatory function and there are nutrients which act as catalyst for certain biochemical reactions. So that is a, a second type of classification that we have. Then a third type of classification that is based on mobility. Mobility means how these nutrients move. That is this mobility can be in the soil, it can also be inside the plant. So based on this mobility in soil we have elements which are highly mobile, there are elements with intermediate mobility and the third category there are immobile nutrients that means those nutrients which don't move in the soil. Then within the plant again we have the same three categories mobile, those nutrients with intermediate mobility and immobile nutrients. Then let us see the different forms in which these nutrients are used by the plants. There you can see there are two forms one is cationic form and the other is the anionic form and it is very interesting to note that one element that is nitrogen it has both cation as well as anion which becomes beneficial for the plant. You can see as a cation you can see the ammoniac ion or the ammonium and among the anions you can see the nitrate. So that and, and one another thing that you need to bear in mind cations are more than anions in the nutrition. Now let us see the effect of soil reaction on nutrient availability. When you say soil reaction is nothing but the pH of the soil or the hydrogen ion activity in the soil. So in this picture you can see there very clearly you can see there when the soil is the pH of the soil is on the higher side that means when it is alkaline in nature the micronutrients are relatively unavailable to the plants whereas the other nutrients that's the macronutrients are relatively available but when the pH moves towards the acidic range or when the pH comes down the micronutrients become relatively more available than the macronutrients. Now this graph will give you a better picture of the effect of soil pH on the availability of nutrients and here you can see whatever we speak about alkaline pH or acidic pH it's always that near neutral pH that provides better availability of nutrients for crops and here again among the micronutrients you can see if you see there you can see molybdenum Molybdenum it behaves slightly different in that group in the sense that the availability of molybdenum is always higher when the pH becomes alkaline in nature. Now do all nutrients move in the same manner in soil and plants? We have discussed about mobility. No all nutrients they don't show a similar mobility in soil and plants. From this table you can see there in the case of we will take one example from this. In the, in the case of nitrogen, I had mentioned that nitrogen is one element which becomes available, that is available forms both in terms of cations and in terms of anions. And here if you see under the mobile category, nitrate that is anion nitrate is highly mobile in soil. But at the same time, the uh, cation ammonium, it is immobile in soil. Similarly, we have categories of mobile and immobile nutrients. Similarly, in the case of plants also, you can see that some of the nutrients, you can see that immobile nutrients, calcium, copper, boron, iron, manganese, sulfur, zinc, 
these are all immobile nutrients. Now, what is the importance of this mobility within a plant? That, that has something to say in the nutritional disorders. When we say nutrient mobility, in this picture you can see, this mobile nutrients means, within the plant, mobility means, the nutrients will freely move through the plants, through the stem and it reaches different parts of the plant. But at the same time, if it is an immobile nutrient, you can see there, most of the mobility is restricted in the lower leaves and they tend to remain in the lower leaves rather than moving towards the upper new flushes. Now here you can see based on this the deficiency symptoms vary. That means if a particular nutrient is mobile then we can see that because if it is mobile means rapidly this nutrient will move upwards and to the entire plant. So naturally when there is a deficiency the deficiency will be first seen in the lower leaves or to be more precise in the mature leaves. But if it is an immobile element, immobile element I, I had mentioned earlier, if it is an immobile element, the mobility, it, the, it will not move from the lower leaves towards the upper leaves. So what will happen? The upper leaf will become deficient first. So the first deficiency symptom or the deficiency will be you can visualize that deficiency in the younger leaves or even in the terminal buds. Now critical concentration. Critical concentration means that is that particular concentration below which a plant will start to show deficiency symptoms. And now you can see in among macronutrients it has got a higher value of critical concentration that you can see for Nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium which I mentioned as these are the three primary nutrients. You can see the level is slightly higher than what is there for calcium, magnesium and sulfur. Whereas for micronutrients there you can see it is much lesser than that. It is in milligram per kg or in other words earlier we used to say this as ppm, parts per million. Now it is expressed as milligram per kg. Now here you can see it is much lesser than the macronutrients and here again in this list if you look at molybdenum, molybdenum the concentration, the critical concentration is extremely low and here you can see this is, uh, you may, we can even categorize it as a ultra micronutrient but in spite of being an ultra micronutrient it is also required or categorized as an essential nutrient for the crop. Now let us see the basic functions, I will be just going through the primary basic functions of these nutrients, Lot these all these nutrients have hundreds of functions but every nutrient has got a very critical role to play in the life cycle of a particular plant. Now in the case of nitrogen, nitrogen if you see there you can see that it is all about cell division and vegetative growth of the plant. What you see outside that is uh, when you see a plant Immediately what you see is the greenness of the plant, the leaves, the stems, the branches. So that has something to deal with in the case of nitrogen. And similarly, it is involved in the formation of amino acids, proteins and vitamins. Coming to the second nutrient, phosphorus. Phosphorus is otherwise referred to as the energy nutrient. So it is involved since it is involved in the energy storage and transfer reactions that is occurring inside the plant. You must have heard about ATP, ATP which is referred to as the energy currency in plants. So there phosphorus has got a very very crucial role to play. And the primary function of phosphorus is in terms of root growth and seed formation. Since phosphorus has got a role in the root growth of the crop, we always recommend that phosphatic fertilizers or those fertilizer materials which contain phosphorus should always be applied at the time of sowing or planting of the crop. Now coming to the third primary nutrient that is potassium. Potassium is also known as a soldier nutrient. Why it is known as a soldier nutrient? We all, we all know that soldiers they guard the country. In a similar manner potassium it protects the plants from different types of stresses. What are the different stresses the plants get subjected to? It can be moisture stress, it can be uh, stresses due to biotic stresses that means stresses due to insect pests, diseases etc. 
and similarly potassium is involved in the carbohydrate metabolism also. So these are the basic functions of the three primary nutrients. Now coming to the secondary nutrients. The secondary nutrients are calcium, magnesium and sulfur. Now in the case of secondary nutrients, when you hear calcium, the first and foremost thing that should come to your mind is all about the cell formation and the cell wall stability. Because the primary function of calcium is always with the cell formation, its division and it is also involved in nitrogen metabolism, translocation and fruit set in plants. Then coming to magnesium, magnesium means the primary function of magnesium is in chlorophyll synthesis. So that means the greenness of the plant, magnesium has got something to say how far a particular plant will look green. It is also associated with the mobility of phosphorus, utilization of iron and in proper maturity of fruits. Now if you come to the third secondary nutrient that is sulfur, sulfur is basically involved in the synthesis of amino acids that is sulfur containing amino acids that is cysteine, cysteine, methionine, these are all sulfur containing amino acids. Similarly, it is involved in the synthesis of enzymes, vitamins and also it has got a secondary role to play in the chlorophyll synthesis. Then if you see the basic functions of the micronutrients, as I told earlier, micronutrients they are required only in very small quantities but that doesn't mean that they are, they are not important. They, have, they are very crucial in many of the important biochemical reactions that is occurring inside the plants. Iron, incidentally, it is the first element that is to be recognized as a micronutrient and it is a metal that all of us know. Now, it is a constituent of heme enzymes. All of us are quite familiar with the term hemoglobin. That is, in human beings, we, we have heard about hemoglobin. Similarly, heme enzymes are there. Within plants, we have catalases, peroxidases, cytochromes. These are all heme enzymes. And it is also, it also acts as an oxygen carrier and it is involved in cell division and growth of cells. Now, manganese, yet another uh, metal which functions as a micronutrient. It is involved in enzyme systems and it also regulates the availability of phosphorus and calcium. Then coming to zinc and copper. Zinc, it is involved in hormone and enzyme systems and it is also involved in chlorophyll production. Especially when I say hormone, it is involved in auxin and it regulates the functioning of auxins. Similarly, zinc has got a role in uh, carbohydrate, starch, metabolism as well as in seed formation. Then coming to copper, now if you look here, all these are metals, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, all these are metals. And coming to copper, Copper, the basically copper is a metabolic catalyst and it has got very crucial role in photosynthesis as well as in reproduction. And similarly, it increases the sugar content and it promotes color and flavor. When, it, when I say that, it, uh, it increases the sugar content and similarly, it improves the color and flavor. Definitely, you can imagine the role of copper in improving the quality of the fruit. Now coming to boron. Boron is an odd man out in this group. Why? Because boron is a non-metal. It is the only non-metal we have in that group of micronutrients. Now boron is involved in germination of pollen grains and the pollen tube growth. Similarly, it is involved in sugar translocation and seed formation. So boron has got a role in pollination and fertilization in crops. The next one is the ultra micronutrient molybdenum. Molybdenum is, the, is considered as the activator of nitrate reductase that is the enzyme that is involved in nitrogen metabolism. Similarly, it is involved in the conversion of inorganic phosphates to organic form and similarly molybdenum is specifically required for nitrogen fixation by legumes. Then coming to nickel. Nickel has got a very specific role to play in nitrogen metabolism and fixation and similarly it also confers disease tolerance to crops. Now we have seen around 17 nutrients. Now these nutrients and for every nutrient there has been a very very specific function also. 
So that does that mean that these nutrients all act independently? It is not so. These nutrients are not islands. Why I say islands? Because we all know that an island means it is a piece of land surrounded on all sides by water. Now I will show you one diagram. Just see this. This is what we call as the Mulder's chart. And here, if you see the relationship between, we will take just take one or two nutrients. That is one is zinc and the other is phosphorus. Now, if you look here, between zinc and phosphorus, if you look at the arrows, you can see there, the arrows between zinc and uh, phosphorus, they face each other. That means they counteract each other. And that is what we call as an antagonistic reaction or what we call as a negative interaction. Antagonism means the presence of one nutrient will affect the availability or the absorption of the other nutrient. But on the reverse side, if you take the uh, interaction between zinc and sulfur, the same zinc and sulfur, you can see that it is a one-way arrow. Then that points towards a positive interaction or in other words, it is termed as synergism. Synergism means the presence of one nutrient, it actually helps the absorption as well as the availability of the other nutrient. So this Mulder's chart, what you see here is a very simple chart. Now let us see one more. If you look at this, it's, this looks something like a neural network, isn't it? So this is the type of interactions that is going on. And this is where we are, we are addressing different types of deficiencies. We are addressing different types of toxicities. So, so this, you can see this, if you look at this, it is very, very difficult to point out what is a positive interaction, what is a negative interaction. But this type of and hundreds of interactions are there among the nutrients, between the nutrients. So this is where we will be discussing upon the different deficiencies and toxicities. Now this is what the farmer usually faces. Suddenly the crop it will wilt. Now he thinks why this is so? It can be due to diseases, it can be due to insect pest, it can be due to moisture stress or finally it can be due to a nutritional disorder also or it may be due to a nutritional deficiency or a toxicity. Now how to identify these deficiencies and toxicities? Now what are the causes of these deficiencies? The def def definitely every deficiency has got a cause. The common causes if you group it together in a common manner you can see that the first and foremost is excessive removal by crops. For example, if you take the case of maize, maize is considered as an exhaustive crop in the sense it requires large amounts of nutrients, it removes huge quantities of nutrients from the soil. So that is excessive removal by crops. Second is leaching losses from the soil. Now why leaching losses? We all know that our country is located in a tropical region. So we, are, we encounter torrential rains and along with these rains naturally the soil moves in the form of water erosion and along with that the nutrients are also lost from the soil. Then unfavorable soil reaction. Earlier we have seen how the soil reaction or the soil pH affects the availability of the nutrients. Then poor addition of organic matter. So organic matter content of the soil. Organic matter is what that gives life to the soil. We always say that soil, S-O-I-L, it is the soul of infinite life. And from where this infinite life comes? It, from, it is from the organic base or the organic matter that we have in the soil. So poor addition of organic matter is yet another factor that contributes towards deficiency of nutrients. The next is the indiscriminate use of chemical fertilizers. Now when we say indiscriminate use of chemical fertilizers, one question naturally arises whether chemical fertilizers are needed. Yes, chemical fertilizers are needed. To supplement what is already there in the soil, we need chemical fertilizers. Why? Because if you compare between organic uh, fertilizers and chemical fertilizers, the content of nutrients is always higher in the chemical fertilizers. So you can address the nutrient requirement of, of, of the crop with a smaller quantity of the chemical fertilizers compared to the organic ones. But the problem is that what we encounter now is the indiscriminate use. That means Without any concern to the soil or to the environment, chemical fertilizers are being dumped into the soil irrespective of the crop or irrespective of the soil. 
and finally we have the antagonistic nutrient interactions i have shown you that mulder's chart there you can see hundreds of interactions are going on and many of them are antagonistic in nature now let us go on to the first element nitrogen nitrogen is usually referred to as the king pin among nutrients that means if nitrogen availability fails it will affect the availability of all other nutrients or rather uh, rather than the availability it will affect the utilization of all other nutrients now if you look into the causes of nitrogen deficiency one is excessive leaching because nitrogen is highly mobile so it is liable to le get leached away from the soil another is addition of materials with high cn ratio or wide cn ratio that means say for example you are applying straw paddy straw paddy straw the cn ratio is very wide so there there can be a temporary immobilization of nitrogen because of the activity of the microorganisms involved so that can also lead to deficiencies of nitrogen then where do you see the symptoms first it is in the older leaves as we have discussed earlier nitrogen is a mobile element so the deficiency will be first seen in the older or the mature leaves and the typical symptom is chlorosis and necrosis of the older or mature leaves and chlorosis for that matter is a very common symptom for almost all nutrients several nutrients have chlorosis as a symptom but the mode in which this chlorosis appears that is more important in the case of nitrogen chlorosis appears from the tip of the leaf backwards in a v shape that you can very clearly see in this picture here you can see that v shaped chlorotic appearance on the leaf this is actually maize what you see here is maize it, you can see that v shaped chlorosis from the tip of the leaf now this is in rice you can see the deficiency in the older leaves there you can see that yellowy that you can see this is another a symptom of nitrogen deficiency then coming to phosphorus phosphorus it is regarded as the energy nutrient in plants in the case of phosphorus we don't see a chlorosis as such and what are the causes of this phosphorus deficiency unfavorable soil reaction why because phosphorus in soil even under alkaline ph or under acidic ph there is a particular reaction which tenders or which renders this phosphorus immobile in the soil that is known as phosphorus fixation then another reason for possible reason for the deficiency is soil compaction and another can be even herbicide phytotoxicity can also lead to phosphorus deficiency and here again like nitrogen this symptom is seen in the older leaves or the mature leaves first both the leaves and the stem turns dark green and the plant entire plant appears stunted so you can see an abnormal green coloration in the plant and purplish discoloration in the leaves and this purple purplish discoloration is due to the accumulation of sugars in the leaf leading to synthesis of anthocyanin now why these sugars accumulate in the leaf it is because that carbohydrate metabolism is affected and naturally when carbohydrate is formed as a result of photosynthesis it has to get translocated from the leaf to the other parts but here that is disrupted so there will be an accumulation of sugars and this will lead to formation or the synthesis of anthocyanin which gives the typical coloration to the leaves and we can see some of the symptoms you can you can very clearly see here that purplish coloration on the leaves and very dark green leaves you can see that purplish coloration very clearly you can see here you can see that purplish coloration discoloration on the leaf and this is typically because of phosphorus deficiency in different crops you can see that in all these cases you can see that purplish discoloration then coming to the soldier nutrient potassium now what are the causes of potassium deficiency poor soil aeration that means water logged water logged soil or soil compaction poor drainage then complete removal of the straw because straw is one of the major sources of potassium and when you when the entire straw is removed from the field 
large amounts of potassium is getting removed from the soil. Then another is leaching, again because potassium is a mobile element, so leaching it is liable to get leached away from the soil. And unfavorable ratios of elements with potassium, that for example, white sodium potassium ratio, white magnesium potassium ratio, similarly calcium potassium ratio. Now this is actually a nutrient interaction of potassium with sodium, magnesium and calcium. Now the symptom, here again it is chlorosis but marginal chlorosis and followed by wilting and rolling of the leaves and marginal chlorosis you can see in the coming pictures you can see it is very clear that you can see that uh, chlorosis along the margins and finally that area gets dried up. So this is a very typical symptom of potassium deficiency marginal chlorosis. Then coming to calcium. Calcium as I said earlier it has got a very typical role to play in cell wall formation cell division all along with that cell formation division etc. Now what are the causes? Degraded sandy acidic soils and excess NPK application. These three major nutrients N, P and K usually our focus is always on these three major nutrients and we tend to forget about the secondary nutrients and the micronutrients. So excess application of N, P and K fertilizers can lead to calcium deficiency. And calcium is a typical immobile element in plant. So the symptoms will naturally be seen in the younger leaves or the leaves at the tip of the plant. Now the leaves turn white, bleached, rolled or curled. Then stunting and death of the growing point. That is important. That growing point gets affected due to calcium deficiency. And this is a typical symptom of calcium deficiency in tomato. That is what we call as the blossom and rot of tomato. Now this is bitter pit of apple. There you can see that bitter pit, small pit like formation on the surface of apple. This is all due to that uh, disrupted uh, cell division cell formation. And this is one symptom in banana calcium deficiency. You can see one more very clear symptom. You can see here that tip of that young leaf has not unfurled. So this is a typical calcium deficiency symptom. A much more clearer picture you clear picture you can see here on calcium deficiency. Now this is in salad cucumber you can see there is a cupping of the leaf the leaf cups there is a cupping like upward cupping of the leaf so that is uh, due to calcium deficiency in salad cucumber. Then coming to magnesium the primary role of magnesium as we have discussed earlier is in the chlorophyll synthesis. Now let us see the causes of magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency is usually dominant in sandy soils. Why? Because we know that sandy soils, the water moves very fast, leaching losses will be more and magnesium, moreover magnesium is a mobile element. It easily moves with water. And another reason is excessive application of potassium. That is another reason for magnesium deficiency. That relationship between magnesium and potassium. Now, typically being a mobile element, it is seen in the older leaves and it present and the deficiency presents itself as intervenal chlorosis. Now you can see here that typical intervenal chlorosis, the veins are all green in color and the intervenal areas are all yellowish in color. That is the typical intervenal chlorosis. You can see here, it's a bit more clear picture of intervenal chlorosis. This is yet another picture presenting that intervenal chlorosis. This is in banana, magnesium deficiency in banana. There you can see in rice, magnesium deficiency. Usually in upland rice, after heavy showers, the soil is a bit of sandy in nature. You can see deficiency of magnesium appearing. Now, this is slightly different uh, symptom in cotton. This is again magnesium deficiency in cotton. This magnesium deficiency, it appears as reddish coloration in the leaves. There is a pigmentation formation and this is magnesium deficiency in cotton. Now let us compare between these deficiencies of N, P, K and magnesium. Of course, N, P, K are primary nutrients, but in all these three cases, we have this uh, chlorotic banding or what you call as chlorosis. 
but this typical chlorosis is different. In the case of nitrogen, you can see that V-shaped chlorotic band starting from the tip of the leaf. In the case of phosphorus, you can see that purplish coloration. In the case of potassium, it is marginal chlorosis. And in the case of magnesium, it is intervenal chlorosis. So this is just to help you in identifying these four nutrient deficiencies. Now to move on to sulfur. Now in the case of sulfur, sulfur although we categorize it as an immobile element, at times we have, we have what we have seen is that it is it also shows a partially mobile nature. That means sometimes you can see this deficiency in the middle leaves also. If it is immobile, strictly that deficiency should be seen in the younger leaves. But at times you can see the deficiency of sulfur even in the middle leaves. So that gives an idea that sulfur shows a partially mobile nature also. Now the causes of sulfur deficiency, you can see that low organic matter content in the soil, highly weathered soils, similarly large content of iron oxides, presence of iron oxides, large uh, quantities of iron oxides, then sandy soils with leaching. So these are the primary causes of sulfur deficiency. And if you look into the symptoms of this deficiency, the symptoms appear in the middle to young leaves. That is what I told earlier because this element sulfur has a bit of uh, intermediate mobility. Then uniformly pale yellow leaves. That is a typical sulfur deficiency symptom that we see. Here you can see that, that uniformly pale yellow coloration on the leaves. And how, now naturally a question comes. How you can identify between nitrogen and sulfur? Nitrogen also that uh, yellowing is there. But here you can definitely you can identify between these two. Why? Because in the case of nitrogen that yellowing it compulsorily it starts in the older leaves. Whereas in the case of sulfur it is either the younger leaves turning pale yellow or the middle leaves turning pale yellow. Here you can see this is sulfur deficiency what you see here. This is in legumes and vegetables, you can see the sulfur deficiency. Then coming to micronutrients. So what we have covered so far, that is the primary nutrients and the secondary nutrients. Now let us see the micronutrients. Micronutrients, as I said, told earlier, their requirement is only in small quantities, but that doesn't mean that they have to be designated as minor or uh, minor nutrients, although we call them as minor nutrients at times. They are minor but essential. Now micronutrients have a very narrow range of adequacy and toxicity. That means if you ask whether they are essential, yes they are essential. But how far it is required, the quantity in which it is required, it is in very very small quantities. But since we say that it is required only in very small quantities, that doesn't mean that it is not required, it is required because they have some very crucial roles to play in the biochemical reactions at, as catalyst in chlorophyll formation, different functions are there. Now coming to that first element, iron. The causes of iron deficiency is primarily high pH or alkaline pH that also we have seen in the earlier slides in the beginning we have seen these micronutrients except molybdenum, all the other micronutrients, the availability is more or less on the higher side when the pH tends to be acidic. And similarly, you can see an antagonism there, excess phosphorus, manganese, copper, zinc and molybdenum, all of them can lead to iron deficiency in plants. And the symptoms, they are seen, the, this is seen in the younger leaves at the, or the, uh, at the tip of the plant. Again, intervenal chlorosis and the leaf turns papery white or necrotic in nature. This papery white color is very typical of iron deficiency. Now let us see this some of the symptoms of iron deficiency. Here you can see that uh, chlorosis in the younger leaves and that picture on the left hand corner, top left hand corner you can see there that papery white coloration that is very typical of iron deficiency. Now this is lime induced chlorosis usually seen in the case of sugarcane and here this is nothing but iron deficiency. 
Then coming to manganese deficiency. The major causes as in the case of iron, alkaline uh, nature of soil and impeded drainage or poor drainage that is encountered in the soil. And the symptoms again, it is an immobile element. So naturally the symptoms will be first expressed in the younger leaves in the form of intervenal chlorosis and necrotic spots. And these are some of the typical nutritional disorders related to manganese deficiency. One is gray speck of oats and there is marsh spot of peas. You can see the picture there. And another is the pehla blight of sugarcane. These are all related to manganese deficiency. And how to distinguish between iron deficiency and manganese deficiency? You can see there in these two pictures, you can very clearly you can see that this necrot presence of this necrotic spots is more prominent in manganese deficiency. While in the case of iron deficiency, you can see there the uh, major veins that is they remain green and the other areas become yellow and it tends to move towards whiteness. Whereas in the case of manganese, the major veins and the primary veins remain green and the intervenal areas turn chlorotic with the appearance of necrotic spots. So because this is very difficult to distinguish between these two, why? Because both these deficiency symptoms, it appears in the young leaves and more or less it is intervenal chlorosis also. So, the, the, so it is slightly difficult to distinguish between this iron deficiency and manganese deficiency. But this criteria, with this criteria you can identify iron deficiency, it tends to go towards that whiteness. Whereas in manganese deficiency, you can, you have to look for these necrotic spots. Then coming to zinc deficiency. If you look into the causes of zinc deficiency, high soil pH, that is usually it is due to excessive lining. Usually we have recommendation for liming that is to alleviate uh, the acidity. But when you go to the excessive uh, lime application, it results in high soil pH resulting in deficiency of zinc. Not only zinc, even iron we have seen that lime induced chlorosis is there. Then there is again you can see an antagonism here. Excessive application of phosphorus or excessive presence of phosphorus, iron, calcium, magnesium, copper and manganese can affect the availability of zinc leading to zinc deficiency symptoms. And what are the symptoms? Here in the case of zinc, you can see the symptoms both in the old and new leaves. It is not that it is seen only in the old leaves or it is seen only in the new or young leaves. You can see the symptoms both in the older and the, young, and the younger leaves. And the symptoms appear as light green, yellow or white areas between the veins of leaves. That is some sort of an intervenal chlorosis. The necrotic spots can be seen in this chlorotic areas and a rosetic appearance of leaves or a bushy appearance of leaves and the leaves become small, narrow and thick. Now this is a typical disease of rice. You call it as a disease. Why? Because in the early 1960s, this particular nutritional disorder was identified as a disease. But later it was uh, uh, confirmed that it is not a disease due to any pathogen. It is actually due to zinc deficiency. And here you can see that this is termed as the Khaira disease of rice. Then another is the white bud of maize. Why? Because zinc has got a role in auxin metabolism. That was also mentioned earlier. So it affects the tip of the plant. So that bud region is affected. So that is white bud of maize. You can see another picture of this white bud of maize, that bud region turning white in color. This is yet another one. You can see that whitish coloration very clearly in this picture. Then another is mortal leaf of citrus, another typical symptom of zinc deficiency, mortal leaf of citrus. Now this is zinc deficiency in chili. You can see that, see that whitish coloration on the leaves, zinc deficiency. And both in the older leaves as well as in the younger leaves, there this zinc um, deficiency can be seen. Again, one common question usually we encounter is that whitish coloration is there in for iron also. But in the case of iron, the, the symptom is confined to the younger leaves. Whereas in the case of zinc, 
you can see these symptoms both in the older leaves as well as in the younger leaves. Now coming to boron deficiency. Now what are the causes of boron deficiency? Here you can see it is more predominant, this boron deficiency is quite predominant in sandy soils with low organic matter and similarly excess content of calcium can counter boron. So that is a, here that is an antagonism, calcium boron antagonism. And the symptoms appear in the younger parts of the plant in the form of malformation, rosetting and dieback of the terminal parts. And actually it results in the death of the terminal bud. That is a very, very typical symptom of boron deficiency, death of the terminal bud. And boron is one element which shows widespread deficiency. One secondary nutrient that shows widespread deficiency is magnesium. And among micronutrients, widespread deficiency of boron is seen, especially in a state like Kerala, we have widespread deficiency of boron. Now, this is a nutritional disorder due to boron de deficiency termed as hollow stem in cauliflower. In cauliflower, you can see that stem turning hollow. And then there is top sickness of tobacco. There again, you can see the terminal bud is affected. Then heart rot of sugar beet, again the tip of the plant ro rotting away. That is heart rot of sugar beet. This is salad cucumber. You can see here there is a malformation of the fruit. Under This is uh, one picture from protected cultivation. And here you can see that open, in precision farming. You can see there that there is a malformation of the fruits in salad cucumber. This is in coconut. One perennial crop which is widely affected by boron deficiency. You can see three symptoms there. One is in the leaves. Leaves, the leaves will not split. Usually in the case of uh, coconut, the fronds, they split. But the leaflets split. But here, there is a lack of splitting of the leaflets. It looks like a fan. And there you can see in the nuts also, you can see extreme case of boron deficiency. The nuts getting affected. Now this is another symptom of boron deficiency in banana and other crops. In all these cases, it is a terminal bud that gets affected. Then coming to copper. Copper, as I told earlier, copper has got a very definite role in reproduction of the plants. Similarly, in the quality of fruits also. And here, excess nitrogen, phosphorus and zinc affects copper absorption by plants. So there is an antagonism there between nitrogen, phosphorus, zinc and copper. Now what are the symptoms? It is naturally, it is an immobile element. So the deficiency will be seen in the first in the younger leaves and the leaves turn, they become twisted. They become narrow, twisted and with pale white tips and chlorotic mottling. And in the case of fruit trees, a typical symptom is dieback. Dieback means from the tip, the, the branches, they die from the tip downwards. Then pollen sterility and reduced fruit set. These are all the implications of copper deficiency. Now this is uh, one, one picture of copper deficiency in rice. This is in pepper. Now you, here you can see this is lettuce actually. In lettuce you can see there the leaves are twisted. They become narrow and the leaves become twisted. Now this is in lime. You can see that the fruit quality is getting affected. Then coming to molybdenum, which is the requirement is in, is, it is in very, very small quantities. And it has got a role in nitrogen fixation, nitrogen assimilation and nitrate reduction. That means in nitrogen metabolism, the role of molybdenum is quite crucial in nitrogen metabolism in plants. And the requirement is higher in the case of legumes. And in contrast, to the other micronutrients, the availability of molybdenum is always higher in alkaline soils. And here you can see that molybdenum deficiency, a nutritional disorder which is known as the whip tail of cauliflower. All of you know what is a whip. The whip, similarly, there you can see in that picture that uh, the leaf progressively it becomes very narrow and finally it turns into something like a whip. So here translucent spots of irregular shape in between the veins of leaves and you can see a residuous gum exudates also on the underside of the leaf. A gum, a residuous gum exudation is also there on the underside or the rare side of the leaves. 
then coming to the reverse side of this picture that is toxicity. Now, when the soil is acidic, especially in acid soils, iron toxicity has always been a problem. And here you can see that iron toxicity, usually in rice fields, you can see this iron toxicity. And rice, mind you, rice has got lot of mechanisms to avoid this iron also. But in spite of that, when the concentration goes beyond a certain limit, the crop gets affected. And there you can see the roots, usually healthy roots will appear white in color. But there, in that picture, you can see there very clearly reddish brown coloration on the roots. That is nothing but the iron getting deposited on the roots of the plant. And now that will affect the root respiration, that will in turn affect the absorption of nutrients and finally the crop will be stunted. And another common toxicity that we usually encounter is hydrogen sulfide toxicity. All of you must be knowing the smell of hydrogen sulfide, that is it has got a, the smell of rotten eggs. So here if you pull out the plants and you can actually smell that hydrogen sulfide, the smell of hydrogen sulfide and this hydrogen sulfide toxicity is usually seen in soils with low content of iron. If the iron content is high, naturally the sulfur will get precipitated as iron sulfide. So sulfur, hydrogen sulfide toxicity will not be there. But if the iron content of the soil is inherently low, you can see hydrogen sulfide toxicity in that particular soil and this type of toxicity has got a typical terminology or a name and that is known as acuity disease or the black crown and root rot disease and this again is seen usually seen in the case of rice why because this is seen under waterlogged conditions this reduction this is actually a reduction reaction in the absence of oxygen sulfur gets reduced to hydrogen sulfide so if you just wind up what we have gone through, through the previous slides, you can see that N, P and K, the three giants, the three primary nutrients, that there nitrogen, the basic function is vegetative growth, formation of leaves, amino acids, growth of the plant. It actually builds the plant or it helps in the growth and development of the plant. So it has all to do with the uh, growth of the vegetative parts of the plant. Now coming to phosphorus, you can see that the basic function is with the development of the roots. Now in the case of potassium, you can see a picture of, the, of a fruit there, it is stomato. Now why potassium? That potassium has got a definite role in carbohydrate metabolism. To be more precise, that role is in the translocation of carbohydrates to the uh, fruits or whichever is the storage organ. The, uh, the translocation of carbohydrates has to take place and that is one of the major mediators of this translocation is potassium. And apart from this, potassium is also known as the soldier nutrient by virtue of its role in protecting the plants against both abiotic and biotic stresses. Then coming to calcium, magnesium and sulfur. Calcium, the primary function is with the cell wall formation as well as cell division. And in the case of magnesium, the primary or the crucial role of magnesium is in chlorophyll synthesis. Then coming to sulfur, the primary role of sulfur is in the formation of sulfur containing amino acids like cysteine, cysteine and methionine and in the formation or synthesis of vitamins and coenzymes. Then coming to micronutrients, you can see that throughout the growth stage of the crop these micronutrients are required and very specifically you can see during germination and establishment, iron, zinc and manganese are very crucial. Similarly, during the vegetative growth, the presence of iron, zinc, manganese, copper and boron. Then during flowering and reproduction, iron and boron, boron, it's very crucial for that. And similarly, during the maturity phase, copper, molybdenum and boron. So throughout the growth, growth cycle for completing or for the successful completion of the growth cycle, micronutrients are required though in smaller quantities and these are the ones which are usually neglected and the weightage is always for nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And to sum up, now we have seen the deficiency symptoms, older leaves, some of the symptoms are seen in the older leaves, in the younger leaves, both in the older and, and the younger leaves, then there are symptoms in the term confined to the terminal bud region. And this terminal bud region, calcium and boron has got a, uh, that deficiency presence in that terminal region. In the old and new leaves, it is zinc. 
and there in that flow chart it is very clear with the symptoms in some cases dead spots are there in some cases there are no dead spots but the symptoms are there and here you can see that classification categorization what we have what we have discussed so far and sulfur deficiency if you remember i had mentioned earlier it is it can be seen in the middle leaves also because of that partial mobile nature and in the case of zinc deficiency uh, it can be seen in the lower middle or younger leaves in any leaf you can see this zinc deficiency depending on the type of crop so that depending on the crop that zinc deficiency the position of that appearance of the zinc deficiency symptom varies so this flow chart clearly shows all the symptoms that we have discussed so far and regarding toxicity we have seen only two toxicities one is iron toxicity which is quite common in acid soils and another is the hydrogen sulfide toxicity because this is a nutritional disorder due to toxicity and any of these nutrients can prove to be toxic if the concentration goes beyond a certain limit that is a critical limit but those nutrients which are easily move which easily gets leached away from the soil or which moves rapidly in the plant usually this toxic symptoms will not be present but in the other cases where wherein these nutrients they tend to remain in the soil and uh, uh, they present themselves then you can see the toxic symptoms also but toxicity and this deficiency bear in mind it is not need not be a straight deficiency or a toxicity why because for one example is zinc and phosphorus if the soil contains excessive content of phosphorus that is high p soils there even if zinc is present in the soil the plant can present itself with zinc deficiency that is because of the antagonistic interaction between zinc and phosphorus so that can also be a reason for this type of a deficiency so that nutrient interactions are also important while you we go for a diagnosis as well as a treatment for this deficiency symptom how to address this deficiency symptoms that is also important of course that how what are the um, corrective measures for this deficiency or toxicity that uh, there was beyond the purview of this particular topic so and here again sulfur deficiency as i said earlier you can see in the middle leaves also and zinc deficiency depending on the crop you can see zinc deficiency either in the lower leaves or the older leaves middle leaves or even the younger leaves so that is all about this nutritional disorders in crops and through this we have seen which are the essential elements how they are categorized what is their uh, role what is their critical concentration then their mobility concept similarly their interactions and finally we have come across these deficiencies and toxicities so that is all about this topic and let me wind up thank you